่ใหญ่นี้จะเจอน้อยมากไอ,ไอตัวเล็กนะจะเจอส่วนมากเมืองไทยใหญ่ตัวเล็กเยอะตัวเล็กตัวเล็ก So more concerned with managing Chipotle Labs than Varroa. Uh -huh. Yes. Okay. Chipotle Labs is a species of mite, somewhat similar to Varroa, but with some distinct differences. It's a mite species that we're hoping we can keep away from the U.S., but we want to be able to do research over here where it's at to see what we can manage and how you can actually kill the mite. My whole industry is just panicked about the not if, but when Chipotle Labs will come. That's spooky, and no, we don't know anything about it. I'd say the top three facts that all U.S. beekeepers should know about triple elaps mites are first that triple elaps mites are not present in the U.S., but if they ever made it to the U.S., they could do really widespread damage in a lot of the same ways that Varroa damages colonies. Second, triple elaps mites, just like Varroa, are completely reliant on honeybee brood to reproduce. And then the third fact is that unlike Varroa, triple elaps mites survive quite poorly on adult bees. So inducing brood breaks or exploiting the brood breaks that you might naturally experience could be a really good complement or backbone of triple elaps management if it arrives in the U.S. It's important to recognize that there are multiple species of Tropopylae laps, but we are mostly concerned with one of them, Tropopylae laps mercedesia. Tropopylae laps mites, when they come out of the cell as potentially mated daughter mites, very rapidly reinfest into a new cell, which really allows them to reproduce at a much quicker rate than what you see with Varroa, and it also makes them much more difficult to control because they're not out frenetically on the bees very much, it's making them more difficult to actually kill. One difference between Tropile Labs and Varroa is that its egg laying rate is quite a bit quicker. Usually an egg every 24 hours, whereas for Varroa it's a little bit more like every 30 hours. So here's the development stages of Tropile Labs. They usually have, well on average, 1.5 to 2 progeny. So they can at least replace themselves, if not double their populations pretty quick. It's been found that in climates that have a lot of brood year-round, they actually can out-reproduce Varroa and out-compete them in similarly infested colonies. I had some colonies in my trial that were right around 1% or less cell infestation, and then two months later, they're over 20% cell infestation. We tried to treat them with formic acid and save them, and they were dead within like seven to 10 days. It just goes to show that even in like 60 days without a treatment in a time where you have brood, you know, you're trying to build up your colony, it can have really drastic effects, sometimes even faster than that of Varroa. When you're talking about the negative effects that Tropile Labs has on your colony, it's similar to Varroa where they can transmit viruses. We already know that they share deformed wing virus A and B. One study in also reports black queen cell virus, which is an incredibly common virus as well. Another study has found acute bee paralysis virus and chronic bee paralysis virus. Varroa and Tropile Labs both vector these viruses actively into the hemolymph of the bee bypassing most of the immunity, but we don't know a lot about viruses. And all of these tests, so far at least, have looked at viruses that we already know. In our research project, our hope is to see whether there are novel viruses that are not known from, from Varroa or, or the bee community so far. Varroa feed on just a single site on the larvae and pupae. However, Tropile Labs feed on multiple sites. They can actually cause deformities while the bee is developing. Adult bees that emerge with Tropile Labs in their cell have a lower overall emergence weight. They also are proportionally more likely to have some form of deformed wing. When you go into a colony that's extremely infested with Tropile Labs, first you're likely to see the mites actually running on the frames and along the frames. Another thing is you're going to see an extremely poor brood pattern. So you might see some bald brood or remnants of bald brood, but you're also likely to see like a lot of nasty, like goopy brood in these cells. And some of it almost looks 
like chalk brood. The biggest thing is you're gonna see an extremely spotty brood pattern, and then you're just gonna see a lot of different brood diseases. Your colony population is probably not gonna be much more than two or three frames at this point. Troplabs, it's starting to expand more into areas where we wouldn't have predicted it would have been a problem, and that's due to the cold weather. But the, the spread has been fairly slow, so it, it's some people moving whole colonies to different areas, migratory beekeeping. And the other is uh, probably just natural spread, swarming, and the, and the mice just expanding their range into new areas. One of the really important things about its biology is that we have no evidence that it can feed on adult bees. So if they're swarming, is there enough brood reared after the swarm establishes to reestablish the troplelaps? You wouldn't think so. But the original host, Abus torsata, they migrate and the mite moves with them. So there's some things about how it persists that we don't understand. I'm doing some PAM-funded work on survival in packages. There is a potential that the mite could survive in packages, and we'll answer that question this summer in Korea. This question of can it feed on adult bees is key, but it was first reported in 1961 as feeding on rats. So the trochlidaeps mite can feed on other hosts. It opens up a lot of possibilities of how it might be moving. A lot of possibilities. Some of the same synthetic chemicals have been tested against triple A mites. For example, fluvalinate and flumethrin, two pyrethroids, are used to control triple A mites. And then there's also some use of thymol based products. The range of treatment options is pretty shared with what we have and use against Varroa. The things that pop up repeatedly is that formic acid is something that works, and we know that that works, and so we can definitively say that formic acid is really good. The other thing that we know works really well is brood break. We know that triple A can't really feed on adult bees, and most of them should die in within three days. Brood is a resource, but it's also a liability in terms of mite populations. So beekeepers who already have brood breaks during their normal calendar year, those management strategies that allow for a brood break to occur, it could be that many more beekeepers would start implementing those. Thai beekeepers, they definitely seem to be keeping very small colonies compared to US standards, and that seems to help them with rope layups management. Which is really one of the things that really worries me because that does not mesh with the way North America keeps bees. They're used to having at least two boxes. One of the issues in Thailand is that it's a tropical place, so there really is brood year-round. But in a place like the U.S. where we can potentially institute a brood break at some part of the year, that should then let us have a season with lots of brood. But there's a, there are a lot of unknowns. Later this year, I'll be going to Korea to continue working on triple elapse mites. I'll be replicating a trial that Rogan ran here in Thailand. One of the treatments that worked well in Thailand was a combination of brood break plus formic acid. It's important to test that in a different environment. Beekeepers in Korea tend to keep bigger colonies and the region is more temperate. So those are two things that it shares with the U.S. We want to have management actions that are effective for beekeepers and we want to know the conditions that are sort of driving effectiveness of some of those management actions. We already know that varroa mites have had a really severe impact on the U.S. beekeeping industry. If triple elapse mites ever got to the U.S., I think there's also huge potential for damage. Because of differences in its biology, beekeepers may need to do different kinds of management to keep triple elapse mites at bay. Having Varroa and the experience with Varroa will provide some advantage to beekeepers because they'll have information and experience with IPM, monitoring, cultural controls, chemical controls. So I think that that will provide a little bit of insight into what they may have to do if Tropolelaps arrives in, in North America. To be successful in beekeeping, you must practice relentless attention to detail. And Varroa impressed this upon the commercial outfits that if you don't, you're not gonna have an outfit next year.